our future lies among the stars, and many challenges must be overcome to reach them. One of those challenges is making sure our ships don't crash into our own garbage littering orbit. People often discuss if our future spaceships will be built down here or up in orbit, and as we discussed a couple months back in our episode Starship Factories, it's just as likely they'll be built deeper out in space and inside contained dockyards. Here, fragile ships under construction don't have to worry about tiny bits of space debris hitting them or the construction crews, who also don't have to worry that any lost nut or bolt or sliver of metal will drift off into space and strike someone moving on a different orbital path like a bullet. And this is the danger of orbital debris. Things orbit our planet faster the lower they are, and that low orbital region is also the most valuable being close to Earth, but they all crisscross at different speeds, and with those different speeds varying by as much as thousands of miles or kilometers per hour. Any tiny fragment of material the size of a pea you collide with carries energy comparable to what we use for heavy machine guns designed for tearing lightly armored vehicles or structures apart. What they do to people in spacesuits or tissue paper thick spacecraft walls is devastating, and in both cases your fragments from that collision join that dangerous debris. One bit of debris strikes something and generates several times its number in new bits. The more things you have in orbit, the more likely this can result in a cascade of damage, with each successive strike spewing more debris, which sheds more things, and we call this cascade Kessler Syndrome. The more developed you are in space, the more dangerous this is, as there are more objects in space to be hit by a bit of debris, resulting in a higher frequency of collisions and a faster cascade ending in a thicker cloud of razor sharp hyperfast bullets above all planets. It has the possibility to leave space over Earth unnavigable, and we have even discussed it as a possible Fermi Paradox solution, in imprisoned planets, and given how important space travel is to this show, and how this could threaten that ability, wrecking our journeys to the stars before they even have left port, I thought a discussion of managing and clearing space debris was a good way to wrap the show up for the year. Though we will still be having our livestream Q&A this weekend on New Year's Eve, or afternoon, and that will be our last livestream for the foreseeable future so I hope you'll join us. Now our focus today is on technologies that can remove existing debris from orbit and be used to prevent buildup or cascades, but we also need to talk about detection of debris, and after that we'll discuss removal options, with the major ones being active debris removal or ADR spacecraft, nets and harpoons, laser brooms, and many more that we will classify as collective methods, laser-based methods, ion beam shepherding, tether-based, sail-based, satellite-based, unconventional approaches, and dynamical system-based methods. After we cover those, we'll touch on the other end of the debris equation, which are regulation, mitigation, and armor, though those are not our focus for today and we'll look at space regulation in more depth next month. Severity and detection is the place to start though because we must be able to detect every bit of junk that's dangerous in orbital space, and it is really easy to forget that dangerous means anything bigger than a grain of sand, and orbital space is simply gigantic. It is easy to forget that even low orbital space is larger than the surface area of our entire planet and much deeper. One tiny band of low orbit is bigger than the entire volume of our planet from the deepest ocean to the highest mountaintop. That works to our advantage in terms of spacing, it's huge and not much is up there, but we need to be mindful that tracking dangerous space debris is somewhat akin to trying to track a pebble drifting around our ocean and pebbles that move through that entire ocean every couple of hours. That's a bit daunting and we should remember that even smaller bits are dangerous too. A number of grains of sand on a strong gust of wind or wave can erode strong materials. A grain of sand in space is typically carrying a million times that energy, meaning that you can get some pretty powerful erosion effects on equipment up there, especially large thin objects like solar mirrors or shades for power collection and climate control. These won't rip a ship apart, but they will slowly wreck things. We also have that question of how dangerous debris is, and it is important to understand that we are not talking about some constant wave of obliteration running around orbit, with some exceptions we'll get to. 
It's kind of like the asteroid belt. In science fiction, it gets portrayed as a dangerous place you would need to dodge through. In reality, it would really be improbable you would hit anything, even flying blind straight through one. Kessler Syndrome was first proposed by Donald Kessler in 1978, but I first encountered it 20 years later as a freshman physics major, and not in one of my classes. I was playing a post-apocalyptic role-playing game called Rifts, which is set after a massive nuclear war and where there is so much debris in space that space travel off Earth is considered impossible, trapping the ruined planet's techno-barbarian survivors from their fledgling colonies on the Moon and Mars. It's implied there that it's not just the huge amount of orbital debris around the planet, but probably a lot of automated and possibly self-repairing killer satellites and orbital defenses designed for killing ICBMs that's causing much of the problem. There's a modest-sized mutant population living in the higher orbital regions which would have less debris and more radiation. And that's a key point, because Kessler Syndrome dissipates with time and is like a lot of debris scenarios such as volcanic eruptions or asteroid strikes, persistent for years but quickly declining. I think we tended to look at the rings of Saturn and assume such debris could persist indefinitely, but it's a different situation. First, unless you are building thousands of O'Neill cylinders in low orbit, then you are not leaving entire mountains worth of wreckage around in space. I do not think many places outside of the show and its forums ever contemplate that degree of orbital development. Even in a situation like that, the effect will build slowly in the human timescale, not wake up one day to red alerts everywhere and space render a ruin of gigatons of bits of fist-sized debris tearing around. Also, the further you are from Earth, the bigger the volume things are spread over and the lower the orbital speed, so objects higher up are less affected. Debris can't persist longer there though. Outside of this scenario, we are not contemplating your typical spaceship flying up into orbit and being hit by ruinous collisions inside a few minutes as it transitions to higher orbits. What we really mean is that space stations up there are in constant danger of severe damage and that satellites would be too. Nothing really remains in stable low orbit for long. That close to Earth, the planet doesn't resemble a perfect sphere and thus gravity on any orbit is going to vary and tweak its every orbit. We also use low orbit because it's as close to Earth as we can get without lots of atmospheric drag, but it's still there minimally and over time slows anything orbiting up there till it falls down. As an example, Saturn's rings are immense and persistent, but Saturn's D-ring is its faintest and thinnest, and the nearest to Saturn, and yet it is still a band 8700 to 16300 kilometers over Saturn's surface, whereas low orbit on Earth is roughly 200 to 2000 kilometers over Earth. Like Earth, Saturn is not a perfect sphere, though its upper regions are at least pretty homogeneous in density, no mountain ranges and oceans massively altering things. This is why we concluded that space debris and Kessler Syndrome weren't good Fermi Paradox solutions in our episode Imprisoned Planets, and the lower the orbit the quicker it is going to clear out. These timelines are on an order of years for low orbit, with the upper bands of low orbit being decades and anything under the space station's altitude falling out in a year or less without station keeping. Debris is also hardly on stable orbits and much would decay in mere days. Once it starts getting atmospheric drag it's basically over and things will burn up, and pushing things into the atmosphere will be a lot of debris management methods. A lot of collision fragment orbits are going to directly intersect Earth almost immediately or send fragments into much more sparse higher orbital regions. So I do not want to say that Kessler Syndrome is overhyped because it is absolutely a big deal, but it's a heightened accidents and wear and tear kind of big deal not a Hollywood explosion and ruin kind. Of course, giant explosions would be one way of handling that, you just start blowing off nukes anywhere that's clear of functional craft and that will clear thicker debris reasonably quickly, combined with actively towing off the larger bits. Now this could reach levels where any spacecraft there would be at risk of ruin by remaining even a few minutes but this would be in the context of huge space battles around vast space structures which emit thousands of gigatons of debris in the first few days and then continue to emit new debris for years or even decades after. Thankfully you only have this problem if you have a huge orbital infrastructure, 
and then it just becomes a long term maintenance cost like picking up trash in cities, hardly trivial but not a make or break situation. And against this threat, we would expect many such space structures to have their own detection system and point defense options. They detect some tiny metal ball or fleck of slag coming their way and automatically blow it up with a laser or whatever. We'll return to this later but for now, while space is still pretty sparse, good detection allows us to spot an object, predict its path, and warn something in that path to exhale a little air or burn a little fuel to bump aside. There's over 20,000 objects, fist-sized or bigger in space, and 100 million larger than a millimeter across, for an estimated 200 tons of garbage in space, which sounds huge, but there are over a billion house-sized objects hanging around on Earth and untoward millions of board-sized objects in our sky. Scale matters, and while we do an amazing job tracking things in space, it's nothing compared to what we could do with a bit better computerization and a more robust space fence of detection. Now as we move into removal options, I think we should start with the preferred options, especially for big objects, which is a variety of collection methods. Large debris can be deorbited to burn up, but a lot of us would prefer to collect it and recycle it, and nobody disagrees that this is the optimal approach where viable. The problem is that unless you have a lot more orbital infrastructure up there than we do now, You not only have to burn a ton of fuel to reach the object, net it, and drag it back to some facility that does this recycling, but you also have to have such a facility and manufacturing in space to use those materials. This, in conjunction with mitigation and rapid response point defense, will likely make up the lion's share of debris clearance in the more distant future. In the shorter term, active debris removal or ADR spacecraft are usually defined as a small ship with a robot arm, harpoon, or net to grab an existing and defunct satellite and shove it down to the atmosphere or kick it up into a graveyard orbit. Graveyard orbits are those designed mostly for higher orbits where it would take a ton of fuel to slam it either into Earth or kick it into deep space, so we move it up to a less valuable orbit. For instance, there's a very tiny band where satellites can orbit at 12 or 24 hour periods, and those are prized and need to be kept clear of debris, so pushing just a bit higher removes the problem, at least for some decades. ADR spacecraft are your means of doing this to any satellite which has lost the capacity to deorbit itself, or which is a big fragment or something that might have gotten wrecked. If you've seen the anime Planetes, where they follow the crew of a vessel whose mission is clearing space junk, That is an ADR spacecraft, but we tend to assume most cases would be robotic and piloted from down on Earth. There is no real reason to pay to put a crew in orbit when a groundside facility could handle it just fine. In fact, you might have that being done by folks who worked from home and had a primary control that handled detection and assigning of a robot to rendezvous and then passed off to whichever local controller was on shift and on that side of Earth when the robot got into rendezvous range and possibly pass it to the next controller as they rotate it out, since the satellite is orbiting the planet every couple hours or less, and being on the other side of the planet would introduce some irritating latency issues from signal lag, thus someone several thousand miles further around the planet might get your feed queued up 10 minutes early so they could observe and take over if you passed your window without the job being done. Now this can be a small robot that is mostly fuel in an arm and just grapples on and drags itself and its trash down into the atmosphere, but this costs you a probe or a trash bot. Maybe it instead connects a disposable rocket or harpoon that would do the work and it moves to the next site, and the next bit of space garbage. We could also attach an electrostatic tether to the dead satellite and let that drag the satellite down so we need not waste fuel doing so. But ideally, we want something refuelable and this could be an example of where a ship carried a number of spools of ultra skinny and conductive cables to either regenerate its own orbital momentum, called electrodynamic tethering, or to attach to one of those junked craft. Electrodynamic tethers or EDTs can serve as a means of propulsion for spacecraft. When a current flows through the tether, it interacts with the magnetic field of the planet or celestial body. According to the right-hand rule of electromagnetism, this interaction generates a force that acts as thrust. By adjusting the current in the tether, spacecraft can change their orbits or perform maneuvers without the need for traditional rocket propulsion. 
they need a power supply to do this, pushing a craft back up, and we discussed this more in our episode Skyhooks. A simple solar panel can do the trick, or RTG, Radio Isotope Thermal Generator, as long as it's fairly massive compared to whatever it is pushing on and has some time to regenerate momentum from that power supply and electromagnetic shoving. However, they can instead generate power by deorbiting things. In this same way, a craft might shove off the satellite it was deorbiting to gain momentum, or one able to run on a metallic propellant might cannibalize the object to give it the resources to shove that object down and move on to its next meal, though in such a situation it would seem implied that you would have the ability to collect and recycle the satellite at that point. I could imagine a small pod not much bigger than a hockey puck that was mostly a spool of wire around a RTG or inflatable solar panel that just magnetically clapped onto a satellite, unspooled and unfurled, and shoved the satellite down, or dragged it up to a graveyard orbit or collection orbit, and a sophisticated one might be able to disconnect, drift away, and wind up for collection itself, once done towing the defunct satellite. The same applies for things using radiant pressure such as a solar sail. Here something hockey puck size might unfurl to several thousand times that size and let solar wind, sunlight, or even a pushing beam hit it to in turn move the collected junk. Spacecraft of this type, along with solar shades or collectors in general, have the advantage of being able to disconnect their main body from their sail with a decent mutual shove sending the main body into the atmosphere or a graveyard orbit while letting the sail blow away to deep space or down into the atmosphere. If we ever get good at making graphene and sails made out of it, this might be the standard dead man switch package on orbitals too, some tiny pod able to unfurl to a million times its normal size and designed to flip on when on the day side of the planet to shove a spacecraft right down into the atmosphere. In the very long term you have to worry about tiny bits of dust making smog around the planet eroding things if not causing gross collision damage, just from the sheer quantity of objects and activity in space for a Kardashev 1 scale civilization. This material is rough on ultra-thin and big objects like solar shades or collectors. Much of this might be metal and subject to removal of buildup by electromagnets, but much would also be blown away by solar wind and sunlight pressure. We might also be able to modify the big thin collector into an active dust collector and one that could afford itself for pickup or atmospheric burn-up when it got too big, assuming it could use the material it collected to regenerate itself and export some. A key notion here, and a big one for waste management on Earth, is not that it's hard to do, it's that it represents a constant drain on your economy at every level. So the idea is to find ways to pull some revenue in from recycling your junk or to minimize the cost of disposal. Space is incredibly expensive and to become profitable and something you or I can go visit one day, we need to make space cheaper and that means minimal disposal cost. From that, I deduce that in the future you will always have a certain haze of garbage around a developed planet because there will be an optimum point. Collection is cheaper the thicker your trash is and beneath a certain threshold we can simply place armor and point defense lasers on the space stations and craft. It is also why I tend to assume more developed space in the future is one heavier on megastructures like orbital rings or space towers, even in high orbits, because spaceship must literally emit tons of propellant to operate, which adds to that smog and will inevitably lose little bits of themselves when employing ultra-high thrust options like rockets that are brutal on physical components. But speaking of point defense and lasers, this is where the laser broom comes into play. Laser brooms are not what most folks think, some big laser vaporizing an object, because that's rather energy intensive. You can do this, and I suspect something like an O'Neill cylinder would have a battery of these for managing unexpected space debris hurtling its way and undetected to the last moment, but the laser broom is a lower energy approach. Comets have tails composed of sun vaporized material and this changes the comet's orbit a bit. It is essentially a weak rocket flame of matter boiling off the surface and shoving off the comet, providing thrust. So if we see an object near Earth we want to deorbit, instead of sending an ADR spacecraft there, we could just target it with a laser and vaporize off a little of its upward or forward surface to shove it back or down a little. 
you all laser ablating a bit of super hot gas off the object to give it thrust in the desired direction. Interestingly, this is a high thrust option for a laser pushing system for accelerating normal spacecraft, as you can't have a big pusher plate you vaporize off the back, akin to how the Orion Drive works, minus the nuclear explosions. This is also a decent option for small satellites that you don't want to try to put guidance and proportion on. You just build its exterior shielding out of a material that laser ablates well and give it little taps with a laser pulse when you need some station keeping. It also means it's better shielded against minor collisions and that any extra debris it adds to space from such a collision is that same material that's easy to laser ablate. You could also be using ion beams for this instead of lasers, especially if the object had a power supply able to generate a small electromagnetic field for those ions to shove off of instead of physically striking. One other option of note is that light doesn't push evenly on things, in terms of their own momentum change. The thinner an object is, the more push it gets from some laser, flashlight, or ion beam. So scattered dust and gas gets shoved by such beams just as well as solar sails, whereas your typical spaceship or celestial object barely notices it, which is why space in the solar system is pretty empty. Any dust or gas that doesn't get drawn into a bigger object like a planet tends to blow away under the sun's radiant pressure and solar wind. This allows us to clear smog and small amounts of junk out of orbital space by being patient or if it's accumulating too quickly, running focused light beams through the area that would do nothing at all to spacecraft and megastructures there but blow the tinier fragments away. In very extreme cases you might use laser ablation as a wide broom to sweep massive sectors or orbital space in a hurry, and those might be anything from bomb pumped lasers to a secondary function of laser pushing beams or energy transmission beams. There are many other proposed methods foam, nanosatellite swarms, magnetic nets, space drag sails or bristles, and even biodegradable satellites have been proposed as well, but that's some of the more discussed ones. Of course the best methods to clear debris is to either not make it in the first place or to get it right away, which is where mitigation and regulation come in. As we already mentioned, detection is the key to protecting other assets from space junk but it is a reality that a lot of that junk is the product of careless, reckless, or indifferent deployment of spacecraft. It's easy to talk of monitoring and agreements of how and when a satellite should be taken down, but we do need to be mindful of defense considerations. As a reasonable and practical approach, you probably would want some treaty that covered what nations agreed to do in their defense satellites and spacecraft like redundant self-destruct mechanisms for deorbiting the satellite while wrecking secret technologies inside it. Something that provides no significant new cost or hindrance to the defense satellite's function and mission would probably be viable as a voluntary enforcement strategy. For everything else, it should be doable to have everything tracked and have it understood that if it doesn't have a plan for deorbiting and a redundant plan too, then it doesn't fly, and if it loses the ability to keep its status known, and that function available, it gets itself deorbited by whatever laser or kilosat anti-satellite system is running. We'll cover regulation more next month, but I think this is where we see a lot of rules about tethering gear to spacecraft or astronauts when EVA, and not dumping garbage out of airlocks or the bottom of orbitals except in a container like a radar reflective bag on a clear deorbiting path. Otherwise you end up getting the equivalent of trash islands in space too as they are prone to going into certain orbital resonances. Indeed this is the loose idea behind dynamical systems-based methods of debris clearance, which aims for math-heavy and fuel-light approaches to clearance, which we are mostly skipping over with that math-heavy aspect in mind but generally still uses those other approaches, just uses them more precisely, and I suspect we would see those methods improved for efficiency's sake, and you might have big recycling depots at some of those spots where trash tended to slowly gather. Ultimately, we need to remember that this will be a growing problem anywhere in cislunar space as we develop into the wider solar system, and that those larger gravity wells like Mars or Venus or other planets will tend to accumulate junk eventually too. I think this is another reason why we should expect to see bigger ships carrying thicker armor in the future, or cellular armor made of many small tanks of fuel or water because the bigger you are, the cheaper thicker armor is, under the cube square law, for a given value of cargo or passenger. 
A big sphere made twice as wide has four times the surface area to armor, but eight times the internal volume, so eight times the mass for four times the armor, which lets you double your armor thickness or save on armor mass proportionally. And you cannot really control what the overall frequency of space clutter in your voyages is, that's a civilization scale problem, and there may be strong regulation of range and capability of point defense systems on ships and habitats. Those are weapon systems after all, but you can control how thick your spaceship or space station skin is, and if everyone is armoring up fairly heavily, that does mean they resent paying more for clearance of debris that's below what would trouble them. So I suspect we will see a bit of a haze of clutter up there as we grow in the centuries to come, and only time and technological advancement will tell how thick that haze might be, indeed it might be lower than it is now. Or it might be an astronomically visible techno signature of planets owned by spacefaring civilizations. Either way, space debris is a problem and one getting worse every day, so putting off solutions doesn't pay, but as we saw today, there's plenty of methods to clear the junk away. Our theme today is that even in a place as empty as space, civilization's garbage might be our downfall if not properly managed. And while I think we demonstrated it was manageable today, if we turn out to be wrong, we might see humanity's future in space taking a pathway where civilization broke into small, dangerous fragments, like that debris in space does, to avoid areas where cascade collisions were possible. This is the idea that civilization itself might become a dangerous handicap, or at least be viewed as one by some groups or individuals, and that this could be a possible Fermi Paradox solution, that people might turn into hermits living in deep space and just grabbing what resources they can while trying to stay far from others, what we're calling the Hermit Shoplifter Hypothesis. We examine that more in this month's Nebula Exclusive. That's out now on Nebula, where you can not only see every regular episode of SFIA a few days early and ad-free, but all our other bonus content, including extended editions of mini-episodes and more Nebula exclusives like Ultra-Relativistic Spaceships, Dark Stars at the Beginning of Time, Life as an Asteroid Miner, Nomadic Miners on the Moon, Space Freighters, Retro Causality, Orc OR and Free Will, Conformal Cyclic Cosmology, Colonizing Binary Stars, and more like next month's upcoming Giant Space Monsters episode, out New Year's Day. Using my link and discount, go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur, and my code, IsaacArthur, Nebula is available for just over $2.50 a month, but this holiday season we are once again offering lifetime memberships to Nebula for $300, part of which goes directly to our show, and part to help raise capital for a number of creator-owned projects we're greenlighting for 2024. Instead of a monthly subscription, lifetime memberships are a one-time payment where you can get access to everything that's on Nebula now and in the future, including our quickly growing catalog of exclusive movies, plays, shows, documentaries, and more. And right now, for the holidays, you can even gift a lifetime membership of Nebula's life-changing and stimulating content. Monthly, annual, or lifetime, whichever you choose, you not only get access to all the great stuff Nebula offers, you also be directly supporting this show. Again, to see SFIA early, ad-free, and with all the exclusive bonus content like Hermit Shoplifter Hypothesis, go to go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. So this was our final regular episode for the year, and this weekend, on New Year's Eve at 4pm Eastern Time, we will be having our final monthly livestream Q&A. After 5 years and 60 Q&A livestreams will be going on hiatus, and it seems a good number and time for a change. And it's certainly been a year of change for me, and almost entirely a good one, getting used to being a father while juggling everything else I do in life has been a difficult, memorable, exhausting, and rewarding endeavor, and I am very fortunate to have an awesome audience who shares my fascination with our future. As we move into the tenth year of this show, I just want to thank everyone for joining me on that journey, which will be continuing in January with a very packed schedule. As mentioned, we have January's Nebula exclusive on giant space monsters coming out on the 1st, then on January 4th, we will return to the Fermi Paradox to discuss the possibility of colony and ecology failure and pancosmoyo theory. On Sunday, January 7th, 
we will deep dive in the functions and use of statites, lagites, quasites, solo moths, mag sails, and other alternatives to classic Kepleorian satellites and orbits that offer us the possibility to move stars or transform solar systems. And speaking of transformation, in the future we might transform animals into more intelligent critters or even human intelligence in a process called uplifting and in two weeks we'll discuss the ethical challenges of that endeavor. Then on January 14th, it will be time for Sci-Fi Sunday and a look at aliens vs AI and which is the greater threat to us and who would win the fight between the two. As mentioned in today's episode, a lot of space debris management is going to come down to regulation and we'll discuss regulating space three weeks from now on January 18th. Then in four weeks we'll talk about settling all Lagrange points and why a society at L5 would be awesome. Then we'll close out the month with a look at how our universe might have began, or how other previous universes might have predated us, in conformal cyclic cosmology. One month, eight episodes, a strong start for 2024. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content like Hermit Shop Little Hypothesis or Giant Space Monsters at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, have a great week, and I hope you too have had a great year.